For many years I held my breath too long, till the knowing left and the weaving ceased. I could not taste the salt from the sea air on my lips, nor feel the warmth of the sun upon my face. Even winter's bite was absent. Seasons passed mournfully, till I began to listen to the faint voice that whispered. I could breathe again when I found myself spinning tales and weaving dreams, painting wild colors on empty boards and moving my hands through clay till life revealed itself. So don't forget to breathe, to forego, to spin and weave and weave, and listen to the faint voice that whispers. I just want to go over a few things. It's also prime grizzly habitat, so we just have to be alert when we're hiking up there. Just uh, use all your senses, you know, always be looking ahead, scanning, and just keeping your ears open if you hear, you know, cracking in the bushes. And we have to stay together as a group. If you do have an encounter with a bear, you want to uh, just use your, your common sense, make a judgment call. Uh, there's different situations that we can talk about as we go up. Um, the most dangerous being a grizzly mother with cubs because she has to be very aggressive. Um, she's very defensive because male bears can kill her cubs and she will um, often fight to the death to protect her cubs. They're very good mothers. Throughout life, each of us endures both painful hardships and soaring triumphs. Lessons are inherent in each experience if we will only listen. We grow by remaining fully conscious of the gifts we are given. Our responsibility to ourselves and the world is to seek out knowledge and act on what we learn. We must breathe deeply, trust ourselves, be unashamed, and gather strength from the lessons learned on our individual journeys to becoming whole. I know, I know. Yeah, you set the pace. Yeah. We'll follow Me? Yeah, set you the set pace. the pace? Yeah. 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 You can be our bear bait. There, there it is. <laughs> I can. I am. You're on bear watch. <laughs> I'll be your backup. And no Anybody that's lived in an abusive relationship, we know it's all about control. Control, control, control. It's not so much the abuse, it's the control, and it's an environment that is very, very difficult to get out of. It's a well-kept secret in a lot of societies, in a lot of cultures. It is a culture issue in some, some respects. It is also an economic issue. We have to address economics. Uh, people think, well, it only happens to uh, families that are on welfare. No, it doesn't. It happens to very affluent people. Leaders in our society, it's happening. It's all behind closed doors, and the doors have to be opened. We all have to talk about it. And I think this is the first step, one of the big first steps that's happened in Canada with this documentary, talking about the, um, the lives of five women who have different backgrounds, different goals, different objectives, different uh, degrees of abuse. There's verbal, there's physical, there's emotional, and there's financial. And there are men that are abused constantly, and they don't speak up. So maybe we have to look at that environment as well. And I don't mean putting it under a microscope. I just mean let's talk about it, let's deal with it, and let's be honest. You need somebody with, with compassion coming to the door to take the statement. You need somebody who's going to believe you. The feeling that they don't believe you is, is abuse over and over and over again. And you find that in the judicial system. Lawyers, prosecutors, oh yes, well, we'll defend her. Oh yes, the police say we'll help her out, but she's going to go back anyways. And that's true. And so, but be believed at the time. Make the effort on behalf of, of all victims that their story is important. Their story is what is happening now and you need help. And you need them to understand that you need help. Whether you go back or not is irrelevant. Whether they have to do the paperwork, that's their job. That's what they're there for. And we have to talk about the abuse that women and men feel when they do speak up, they go forward and try to get the legal, the legal beagles on side. And judges are, are not sympathetic to, to the cause or the needs of victims. Not at all. Nor the medical profession in some respects. 
I had a motion 515 put through uh, during the session that I that I was in last fall that dealt with uh, the need for recognition in the province of Alberta by the government to uh, loosen up the purse strings and identify needs in shelters, whether they be outreach programs, follow-up programs, do we need more spousal violence uh, teams to work in a city, in the rural areas, and I think the rural areas are totally neglected in terms of support groups, networking. We have to uh, go to the small communities and identify needs. Where do women go and men and elders and children for support? Let's work together with social services and identify those needs and not be afraid to move ahead and not be afraid to put money where it's needed. I was in huge depression and now I'm, I'm hearing the birds outside on my deck. I'm able to uh, decorate the odd room and to start moving ahead one step at a time. And it's not something that happens overnight because 12 years of abuse didn't happen overnight. Uh, my finances are in place. I'm still struggling. I left with nothing. I left my car, all my furniture, all my belongings. Um, I started with maybe one pot and a couple dishes. So there's no there's no shame or no no stigma to when you've had enough and you move on, leave things. It, to me, goods are not that important. Items. Your life is more important, it's time to leave, something clicks in your mind, you go when that happens. Whether you go to a women's shelter, whether you go on your own, get your own place, whether you move in with family for the support. My boys are very, very supportive now in any effort that I make on behalf of all people that are abused. They take care of their mom. Uh, they would, li would like to have been part of taking care of me during that process that I went through and felt that I needed to be alone to do it, when in fact you don't have to. I want other women and other people that are in abusive relationships to realize it takes time. It is nothing to be ashamed of to say, I need help. You seek out the help that you need for where you are at that time. Where, where I see myself in the future, uh, Hopefully, I'll see myself on the federal scene. Um, I'm talking in terms of economics and moving forward. Um, I, I will be a strong advocate on behalf of all women, on, on behalf of anybody that's abused. I hope that I have something to offer. I, um, I will work hard on that behalf. And I see myself as an advocate working for the betterment of society. Uh, the prickly thorns here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Me jam them before. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a good bear food. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't look like Our heroes teach us the way of courage. They look straight into the eyes of what others fear and speak out with their best voice. They listen intently to those whose voice is at times unsure. Our greatest heroes with fearless eyes and caring hearts show us that there is power within us all. I think a, a, a good gauge of, of what's happening in your life is looking at your kids. And um, I saw things in my kids that were, were scary to me. There was a lot of arguing going on in our house and I was to the point where, you know, I was starting to feel a little more independent and my ex-husband, the, the further I, I pulled away and became myself, the harder he came down on me and the more violent he became and uh, the more it, it came out in the children and um, my eight-year-old well, he's eight now but at the, at the time he was four he always had these little men that he carried around and they they were little X-men or some little figurines but but they were big bad muscular figurines with guns and and knives and he would never go anywhere without them and um, now when I look back I realize that these things were there to protect him because he didn't I don't think he felt like I was protecting him or anyone was protecting him I was so wrapped up in, um, in what was happening with me and so depressed I think that I just couldn't be a, a good enough mother to my kids.
I remember when I was with Sydney, I sat down one day in the middle of all the turmoil and I tried to think of what I wanted to do and I couldn't even think. I couldn't think of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And now I can think of a hundred things. Well, economically, we put so many businesses together and uh, it's hard to walk away from employees and, and the whole dynamic of your empire, you know, business, property, and, and you do get scared and you wonder, am I going to be able to survive after this? And will, will I be able to support my kids or will I be on the streets? But um, I think I was poorer then than I am now. You know, then I was poor even though I had anything I wanted. I was poor and dead inside and the expense was terrible. I you know, probably spent 100000 in legal fees. But one thing I can do is I can hold my head up and I can say I didn't go there and get as dirty as they did. You know, like Kim said to me the other day, you don't have to, you don't have to be angry and revengeful because the universe takes care of everyone. What's, what's the worst that can happen? I don't have as much money I, as I have now. I already know my kids are really healthy. Or my youngest son especially. I still have a hard time with my older son. I always wanted to have that house in the neighborhood that every kid could come to. And I have that now. I mean, they all come and unload my refrigerator and hang out all day. And it's a disaster around the house most of the time. But I, I look at my youngest son's face and I think, gee, you know, this is, this is what I've always wanted. But could never have before. My biggest goal right now is just to save my kids. I don't care what it takes. That's that's my biggest thing is my kids. If I can get them out of this cycle of violence and, um, and if they have happy relationships, that's, that's the biggest thing for me. I want to have healthy kids and I owe that as, as being a mom. That's, you owe your kids that much. You owe them nothing else. And actually, I can oh, buy you a little wait a minute. here and show yeah. you uh, the difference is that between a, a, or is that a mm. And this would be actually the um, the right the right uh, foot because it, it extends down a little further here. Mm -hmm. It's sort of sh shaped like that. Okay. As human beings, we can make decisions and actions that will help deliver us to inner peace. The freedom to choose the course of our own lives is our most precious asset. So, uh, like Only by having potato. all options open to us can we have our freedom. So this is lunch. Enjoy. It's on the house. <laughs> Getting out is one thing. Staying out is quite another. The turning point for me in making the number 17 trip out the door, the last one, was that my family came to me and said, if you don't make this final, we can't be there for you anymore. And having my family meant so much to me. My 16-year-old daughter, she was 16 at the time, said to me, Mom, if you let him back in here, I'm leaving. And I value my children way more than I value the abuse that I put up with. I have met many women who've been in abusive situations who are just as abusive as their partners. And if you go to a transition house and you are abusive as well, please, by all means, tell the person that you're talking to and you can get help for your abusive nature as well. I had to. The resources that I drew upon to help me through this were um, self-help books speaking to women who've also been through this ordeal. Sharing with my children was, was very difficult, so I sought help through social services on how to speak with my children and how to help them through this. I talked to some child counselors. I talked to adult counselors. Victim services was very helpful. They explained the court process and how to go about um, securing my home environment. And my lawyer was extremely helpful. The police were very understanding, especially when they brought a female officer. 
I did have some resistance from the police because the situation was repeated so many times and I think that they felt after a while that maybe I was a lost cause. So I had to reach out to my family, friends and neighbors and ask for written letters from them and go to the police and really convince them that this was a serious situation. And once they were convinced that it was a serious situation and that I was really ready and willing to do something about it, then they all rallied around. There wasn't enough that they could do to help me. I see myself helping my children. I don't know that in five years they'll be completely over all the trauma that they've been through. And it's really important to me that they become whole and healthy again. Every day that I wake up, I'm very grateful to be on this earth. I'm very grateful for all the people that love me and support me. It's really, really important to know that speaking the truth frees you. Speaking about the abuse, telling people where you've been, where you want to go, speaking your own truths and telling people that you've been through these things, that you've survived these things, um, that some of the things that happened were because of these reasons, and not necessarily putting the blame elsewhere, but clarifying for other people why things have happened this way in your life. And it helps them understand where you're coming from and why you may have acted or reacted in a certain way. Um, uncovering the abuse and getting it out in the open is very freeing. It lightens the load. It takes a, a, a big weight off of your shoulders. Had we all had the forethought, we wouldn't have been there. However, we've been there. And it's really important to admit that you've been there, that you've survived, and that you're willing to go on with your life. You see, that's another good thing to do is um, check it out, see how fresh it is, and you can uh, do that if it's on grass. You can from the depths of women's souls comes the power to unite and create change. The watchful full moon has seen their courage hold fast over many seasons. The warrior hearts of women will forever charge forward with a force of such power that we will take notice, survive and thrive. Uh, my, my biggest challenge is to see myself in the future in the first place. Uh, this is what I'm dealing with the most every day. Um, Trying to make plans and, and have goals is something that I find very difficult. Um, I have been very comfortable in struggling and in, in being in chaos, and now imagining anything wonderful and successful is very scary to me. So I needed to be in trust with somebody who, whom I knew had my best interest in mind. I found a, a friend, her name is Esther, and uh, she became my mentor. Um, I've learned through her how to trust and um, learn to love myself and be patient with myself and develop a long rapport with her. So conversations with her and um, just unconditional love, that really helped me out. Uh, my best tool at this point is writing, another outlet. Um, I really appreciate doing things that are all natural and uh, staying away from medication is very important to me, although I, I do take certain things right now. But um, it, um, that really helps me getting through the moments of anxiety that I go through. And it's a wonderful med meditation to me. I can hop on my bike and go for a ride in Victoria for two hours, three hours, and uh, feel really clear. And um, it, it helps me burn out some energy that I could not um, burn out otherwise. I just uh, recently graduated from a program called Bridges. And um, this program helps women who have been off of work for quite a while to um, center themselves and uh, find out where they want to go. Um, practically, I've been off of work now for five years and working on my self-growth and try to uh, find out who I am and where I want to uh, head to. Now I'm pretty much ready to go back to work. and. Um, whatever that may be, uh, I'm finding that I'm becoming more 
acquainted with myself and, and learning to love myself and uh, reach out for, for help when I need to, uh, stay calm and enjoy life. This is where I'm at now. I like to do balancing rocks. It's a great way to indicate all the days I've survived and it's a great meditation tool. Strong foundation. Um, sometimes with sub-adult bears, which are just like teenagers, you know, they're testing their environment. Right. They're not too sure of themselves. So they're they're right. going to push and see no matter what. what kind of reaction they get from you. Women and men must start now to pay back to the earth for the seasons of bounty we have been allowed. We must be reverent toward our surroundings and share our vision of peace with everyone we meet. When all the people of the world agree there is no need to fight, our debt to Mother Earth will have been paid. The first turning point was when I saw the violence begin to show in my children. And I realized that from there it was just a downward spiral. Um, the longer we were in the family violence, the more my children acted it out. And that was just too much to bear. And, and I think that as long as it was just my ex-husband displaying the anger and the violence, that was one thing. But then when I started to see my children and I just mourned for their childhood and all the lost years and the lost innocence and how they were going, and I knew that if we didn't stop it, that if we didn't change it then, that their future would probably end up to be the same as their father. And that I could not live with. The other triggers were, I think, my son's cries. And they were very, um, they were very clear. Um, my youngest son, especially, um, he displayed a lot of um, abusive and violent behaviors in school. Just he was acting out everything that was being displayed in the home. And um, I was having to deal not only with the family violence, but then what he carried over and into the schools as well. And I knew that it was destroying his life even more. The final trigger was um, I had gone out for dinner with a girlfriend. I just started developing these excruciating abdominal pains. And she took me to emergency. They assumed that I perhaps had an ulcer. And I realized that, you know, if I was diagnosed with a terminal illness, I wouldn't die in this relationship, so why would I live here? My friends helped me the most. Um, mm -hmm. I had a very few close friends who helped me enormously. And even though I was not very good about opening and exposing my story, there were a few friends who could just look at me and see everything. And they were the ones that touched my life. And they were a touchstone. And sometimes I didn't have to say anything. And they just looked at me, they knew, and they knew what to do. So as far as, you know, what did I do within the community? Not much. I knew there were a lot of um, uh, facilities and organizations that could help. But because of where I had come from, I wasn't used to asking for help. And it was near impossible. And um, I learned, I remember my sister saying to me, you know, please ask for help. You have to learn. And through that, I just, when help was offered to me, I tried to graciously accept. And that is probably the best advice that I could offer other women, is that when people offer support and help, you know, don't put up the front and say, you know, it's okay, I can do it. Because sure, we can all do it. But to receive help and to let someone in during those times, it not only helps, you know, it not only helped me, it helped my children, and I think in some way, too, it helped the person who was giving as well. It became this, um, we became family. And they helped in many ways. Um, sometimes I had friends who merely dropped off a couple of meals during the week. That was, you know, enormous. Um, sometimes it would be just going for a quiet walk through the park and just sort of talking about stuff that came up. Um, sometimes um, my friends or my sisters would take one of my children. That was um, an enormous help because I realized that if my children were happy I could let go a little bit and concentrate on what I had to do because that was probably the hardest thing to get through was thinking about my children. 
And that was actually what delayed the leaving. So, you know, another thing for, for other families who are going through crisis like this, you know, if, if I knew that somebody could just swoop in and support my children, it would have left, you know, just sort of brought enormous weight off my shoulders. So there I was in the midst of chaos, leaving my 15-year relationship, packing up our personal belongings, packing up the children, and I had this coffee table in my kitchen, and I was tiling it, and one of my sons and I, we were smashing tiles on the kitchen floor, and breaking them into all sorts of pieces and shapes, and I just remember this, like I thought it was so strange, but I had to do it. and. Um, I realized, you know, there was tiling in the center, and I realized that from all of these broken pieces, these broken shards, I had created a mosaic all around the outside of the table, and I completed it before I left. And I sort of feel that that is where I'm heading. I'm from this broke, from the broken shards and the broken life, I'm creating a mosaic. And it's sort of like with all the pieces that used to be me, they are now just in different places and different shapes and different colors and I'm rearranging my life and I'm creating a mosaic. I am in such a good point today. It's been almost two years. Um, it has taken this long for my sons to sort of come full circle, um, at least one of their full circles. I, I know there's a lot more that has to go on and it, it could be you know, a lifetime process for my sons, but they at least are laughing. Um, we sit around and we tell stories. Um, they are seeing me in a new light for the first time in their life. And for me, that is one of the biggest gifts I can hope for right now because um, they haven't seen me in this light. It's like, you know, the old Kim has come back to life. You know, that person who is just so full of joy and, um, and adventure and humor it's all being revisited and um, and as I come alive I watch it in my sons and there's just such a reflection and they're coming alive um, you know there was not much humor with them before they did not smile um, there wasn't a lot to smile about and so when I see the twinkle in their eyes um, I just know that you know we're on the right track and and the healings in place and it will take time and then it's just a matter of what I can help instill in them as what they do with this, how they see their past, what they take with them um, and hopefully that they won't ever repeat the cycle that has been created. And I want other women to know that once they get through the crisis that there is hope, that there is promise and that you have to believe in yourself and go forward and as long as you can believe in yourself others will see it in you as well and um, and we don't need to remain stuck and sometimes you know I think that what you can't forgive you have to forego and then ultimately forget and you have to move on um, because I think we always have a choice of how much we carry forward into our new life and I don't want to carry any of it forward. I just try and let it all go. Because I know that it's too much to carry. And I know that if I was to carry what I've been through into my present life and future life, I wouldn't make it. So I choose to forgive and forget. And that is the only way I see um, healing. And in that process, in the process of forgiving, I think you find your own resolve in your own way and your own time. Because sometimes I think it is just too much for any one person to endure. And then I think of my children and I think if it's too much for me, it's way too much for them. So, forgiveness. Even though I slip quietly into the night, 
darkened and moonless, with only a shawl of innocence wrapped round my bones, I shall find my way. Even though I leave many who have known me half a lifetime, they know me not. They know not why I leave, or if I can. I am told I ask too much from life. Even though I have been parched from shedding my last tear, failing to drink from the well of hope, I shall find my way. When the moon rises in the night sky, reaching its ripened fullness, I shall bathe in its silver light. Like the fool, I step out into the unknown with a sure foot and trusting heart. With only a shawl of innocence wrapped around my bones, I shall find my way. Right. 